Welcome back to the Big Ideas Theater. I'm Ed Hyland. This is AARC Congress, and thanks for joining us. I'm joined now by Thomas Pereno. Thanks so much, uh, St. Michael's Hospital up in uh, Toronto. Yes. So welcome to uh, Las Vegas for the Congress. Thank Talk you. about uh, visualizing mechanical ventilation. We had a chance to talk beforehand a little bit about it. So you're going beyond wave, waveforms, right? Yeah, I mean, the most common way that we, as respiratory therapists, think of visualizing ventilation is the fact that all of our modern ventilators have waveform graphics on the screen that shows the act of air and oxygen moving in and outside of the lungs. We have flow waveforms, we have visualization of the pressure being generated within the lung, and of course the volume going in and out with that flow. But really moving beyond that, so instead of just referring to that, now we're getting into ideas of dynamic imaging at the bedside. And uh, this involves things like lung ultrasound, where we can visually see the impact of the ventilation that's going in the lungs in regional areas of the lungs. So if you have collapse over here, or a little bit of atelectasis, or increased interstitial edema, these are things that can be sort of looked at with ultrasound at the bedside. And so you can visualize this active movement. And then we have things like diaphragm ultrasound, which actually ultrasounds the diaphragm to see that it's moving and functioning properly, or if it's being excessively utilized. Um, and then we have electrical impedance tomography, which is a non-invasive rubber band that, it, that straps around the chest and shows us where air is, and oxygen is being distributed through the lung. So this is the real distribution of ventilation, this visualizing. So now we have the ability to see, okay, what is the impact of the pressure we're putting in the lung? How is it moving the lung? So we have dynamic lung movement. And then we have diaphragm function, all things that go beyond just the graphics of going in and out of the ventilator. This, so it's a way of visualizing it. And this is really, I think, the next step for respiratory therapists, to be honest. Now, uh, you've been getting into it, but I mean, really the, the level of evidence, you know, do, I mean, do you have the data that you need? Is this, is this actually giving you a good, accurate picture of, of, the inf of what you need to find out? Yeah, so we have good data that the lung ultrasound, uh, for example, techniques are very uh, consistent with findings of chest x-rays and CT scans. They're actually like high sensitivity and specificity for a number of conditions, like pneumothorax and consolidation and pneumonia, et cetera. Um, with diaphragm function, uh, we actually have some really interesting data coming out of Toronto with Dr. Ewan Gulliger looking at diaphragm thickening fractions. So how much a diaphragm thickens sort of it represents how much the contraction is happening or how much the work the diaphragm is doing. And he has some very interesting data looking at insufficient effort, so weak effort, and also excess of effort. So outside of a range of 15 to 30% thickening fraction, anything below that is insufficient effort and above that could be excessive. We have data that this is linked to clinical outcomes um, in terms of longer time on the ventilator. And he just recently published a mediation analysis that actually looks at, could this possibly be uh, an effect in multiple uh, randomized control trials that maybe noise that could impact either side of a randomized trial. So maybe I'm doing a ventilation study, but I'm not looking at effort by these patients. The effort could be added noise that could actually impact the outcome measures we're looking at for other reasons. So very interesting stuff, uh, hypothesis driven. We don't have solid data that this is in fact causal, but the association is there and it's very interesting stuff. And then with EIT, we're still at the birth of this. So currently just getting uh, hopefully close to FDA approval here in North America. It's used globally worldwide. We've been using it in Canada since 2013. And this device, um, in terms of the data that we have out there, they're all physiology studies, sort of conceptual, like can we set PEEP better or more optimized with electrical impedance tomography? Because it will tell us that the lung is being over distended or there's a large area of collapse as you move ventilation, so your PEEP up and down looking at areas that are being ventilated or not, um, looking at endotracheal tubes that are sort of main stem. Like, there's information that it provides, a lot of case reports and observational studies, but we actually don't have solid randomized controlled trials that are driven by this lung imaging technology. And I think because it's more of a monitoring tool than it is telling you what to do. Now, EIT has the ability to possibly tell you what to do and guide your therapy. But we don't have the randomized control trials to show that it is the thing to do yet. Um, so we're still early. A lot of work needs to be done. Hopefully, respiratory therapists are driving a lot of that work. And yeah, we have a, a lot more info to, to learn from that. Yeah, I was going to ask, what, what role can respiratory therapists, uh, you know, how can they help you, basically? Yeah, so the, the thing about dynamic imaging uh, and visualizing ventilation is that it's point of care stuff. This is stuff that needs to be looked at and visualized during mechanical ventilation during the manipulation of the ventilation as well. So if an RT is in clinical practice and manipulating the ventilator and they want to sort of look at and analyze the response to therapy, this dynamic imaging works right along with that. So the idea of point of care uh, imaging is different than sort of 
ordering someone from another service to come and sort of do some diagnostic testing. This stuff has to happen in real time as we manipulate the ventilator. So the role of the respiratory therapist is that if it is your role to manipulate a ventilator, we should embrace the idea that if we can learn, obtain skill and maintain skill in using imaging such as ultrasound or electrical impedance tomography to influence the care of our patients, uh, it just seems like a match made in heaven. The person manipulating the ventilator and the dynamic imaging showing the impact of that manipulation. Those two things combined, I think, are the future of what we can do as respiratory therapists. Sounds like some studies are involved here. We need to get some uh, participants as well. Yes. Thomas Moreno, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. This is the Big Ideas Theater at AARC Congress.